QuickBooks Point of Sale prompts you to register the Point of Sale software each time you start the program until registration has been completed. The software must be registered or it will not function on the sixth day after installation. To register your Point of Sale, from the Product Registration screen, click Register Now. If you are connected to the Internet, an online registration form displays. If you are not connected to the internet, the phone registration window is displayed. Dial the number listed to register. Okay, then what you need to do is we need to put our primary business phone number in there. And it just has to be the last four digits. And then you need to put in your zip code. And then you can click continue. And then it tells you thank you, your QuickBooks point of sale software has been registered. Then go ahead and finish registration. And then what will happen is it will show your license number and your product number. And what I suggest is that you have those numbers written down somewhere in a safe place. So if you need to reinstall the software, you will have that information available. The first step to setting up your point of sale is to create your company file. From the file menu, select company operations. In the dialog displayed, select create new company. If you have multiple computers to set up, then you will check the multi-user configuration. We don't, so we will leave it blank. Select Next. If this is the first time you are running Point of Sale and you have been prompted to create a company file, you will start at this location. Let's enter Carl's Computer Shop for the company name. For multi-store software, specify your store type, and if you're setting up at a remote store, specify a store number from 2 to 20. For this demonstration, we will select the headquarters store and then click Create. Point of Sale displays a status indicator bar as it creates the new company data file. This can take a few minutes. Now that we created a new company, our setup interview launched to assist us in configuring our program for our store. The setup interview launches automatically to assist you in configuring the program by asking a series of questions. The information you provide in the interview is used to set up basic program options, customize features, and set up hardware. Also, there's an option to sign up for the QuickBooks point of sale merchant and gift card services. If you have to access the menu manually, you can go to File and then go to Setup Interview. If you are not prepared to complete a section, skip the section until later. You can always return to the interview at any time to change most choices. The program settings configured during the interview can also be reviewed or revised later by accessing the company or workstation preferences from the File menu. The preference windows are also where you can set up more advanced options that are not covered in this interview. Okay, we will start by adding the store name. We'll go ahead and we'll name that Ales Sports Hut. And the address we'll use 123 Anywhere Lane. And the city we'll name any city. We will put Michigan and we'll just use any zip code there. Okay, and then in the other info section, you can enter in a phone number and that will show on the receipt. And you can also enter a email address, website information, and then you can change the receipt message if you want to. Once you're done with that, you can click Next and it will take you over to the next tab, which is the Sales Tax tab. As you complete the setup interview, you are asked to enter a primary sales tax rate and the agency to which you pay the sales tax collected. Based on this information, Point of Sale creates two default sales tax codes, one taxable and one non-taxable. For a single tax location, identified as local sales tax. When a sale is made, 
sales tax is automatically calculated and added to all taxable items according to the tax structure. If the situation requires the collection of different tax rates based on the type of merchandise being sold or where the customer lives, enter the rate charge most often and then later after completing the setup interview, set up other tax rates and advanced options in company preferences as described in the following section. So for sales tax in the state of Michigan, they charge 6%. So we will highlight the 7 and we will change that to a 6. And then for the name of the tax agency, we pay it to the state of Michigan. And we can click Next and that will take care of the sales tax. After you've been approved for Intuit Merchant Credit Cards, Intuit will send you a welcome email. This email will ask that you set up your account password. Once you set up your password, you can set up your QuickBooks point of sale to accept credit cards from customers. Your email and password information should be kept in a file because this is how you also log in to your Merchant Center account. In the Setup Interview tab under Payments, choose Yes to accept credit and debit cards. Then click into the Sign In button. You will enter your email address and your password. And then you will click on the Sign In. Now if you have any questions or if you need help, you can call the number listed below at 800-348. 0254. We will click sign in into it searching for the account and I don't think they're gonna find this because this one is set up with my other credit cards. Okay so they didn't find anything. If that happens with you you can go ahead and you can call into it and they can help you out with that. Otherwise it will say that you're signed in and once that step is completed, you will not have to set up again unless you reinstall the software. You can also edit your payment preferences within this window. We will discuss the payments preference setting later when we go through the company preference section. Overall, integrating with Intuit credit cards saves you multiple steps that will save time at checkout plus time when you're reconciling. In other words, credit, debit, and gift card sales can be processed, settled, and reported within the point of sale. Next, we will go to the gift cards. To apply for gift cards, simply apply online by clicking that button or call 1-888-623-0387. Keep in mind that you must have an Intuit Payments account in order to have gift cards. You'll configure point of sale for the attached hardware after you create the company data file and as you complete the setup interview. The hardware setup wizard is launched automatically when you configure your hardware in the setup interview. If you add hardware in the future, you can manually access the setup wizard from the file menu or from the hardware configuration pages in the workstation. Do not connect hardware to your computer until instructed to do so by the wizard. If you are installing non-Intuit hardware, the wizard may prompt you to use the manufacturer's CD or instructions to install the device. When finished, return to the setup wizard and continue. If you have multiple workstations, the hardware wizard setup is launched automatically or can run manually from each workstation. Optionally, hardware can be set up in the workstation preferences. From the file menu, select preferences and then choose workstation and then you can select the hardware type from that preference list. When you configure the hardware for the first time, label the cords to the USB ports. If for some reason you need to move the equipment, it will be very simple to match it up to the correct port. Otherwise, you will need to reconfigure each piece of equipment to the computer. This tip will save you much time and aggravation. The interview complete page appears when the interview is finished and you are ready to begin using point of sale on the server workstation. In this section we will talk about the general part of the company preferences. First let's go to file, choose preferences, and then company. 
in the general section under options we can choose if we want to require users to log in enabling this feature will further secure the workstation and have the added benefit of tracking sales by the logged in cashier for each transaction this is a best practice recommendation the next option is to automatically log out user after each sale. This setting will require a login by the appropriate cashier for each sale, allowing the retailer to track sales by cashier. The next option is to warn when editing documents, items, or customers, or to warn when deleting documents, items, or customers. We suggest that you enable these options Next is to bring back all one-time messages. There are a number of places where you can hide messages such as selling negative quantities, etc. Click this checkbox to enable all of the messages. In the select features to use, you can choose to track customers. This turns on the customer name field in the sales receipt form in the Pro and the Multi-Store version. You can choose to record shipping addresses on sales receipts. Checking this box turns on the ability to record shipping addresses and allows for the, for the printing of packing slips and shipping labels. If you choose to create customer layaways in sales orders and work orders, these next three boxes allows a customer to turn on and off sales orders, layaways, and work orders. Keep in mind that work orders are the only order documents with the due date. And again, that's with the Pro and the Multi-Store version. You can choose to use styles to help organize your inventory. This is a best practice for clothing stores and other customers who sell the same item that varies by one or more attributes. You can choose to track employee hours. Use this checkbox to enable clock in, clock out functionality. Keep in mind this feature allows for very simple timekeeping and does not track schedules, breaks, or those kind of things. You can choose to create purchase orders when buying and or receiving merchandise. Our next area is a data safeguard. This is where you can set up how you want to create your backups. You can choose once a day when exiting the program Although selecting this option will create a backup in the default location each time that you exit. The next one is every day at a specific time gives you an option to set a time and different location for the backup. Keep in mind that the program must be open for the everyday feature to work. If you want to have your pictures backed up while you're creating your backups, then you would choose this box. You can show EMV reports. This means that if you have credit cards through Intuit and you have the EMV is set up, then it will show the EMV reports. And the last one is a usage study. With the usage study, if you want to participate in that, it helps Intuit either update some changes within the system that need to be made or when they go to upgrade the software, hopefully they will add your suggestions that you want or need. That is a general area. With the store headings, this information is used on the sales receipt. This is also where you would import a logo to be printed on the receipt. And then the next one is your field labels, so you can add custom fields to each of the various sections of the program. We will go over field labels throughout the training videos. And, it, and that completes our general section of the company preferences. You click Save to save your preferences, and then we go back out to the home screen. In this video, we're going to review the company preferences for inventory. Let's go back to our file, preferences, choose company preferences. We're going to go down to the inventory. If you choose to associate pictures with inventory items, that enables the picture functionality within your point of sale. You have your item number sequencing. 
if you choose this preference, this will reset automatic item number sequencing when an item number is edited. So what will happen is, is if you are at number three, but then you go in to edit the document and you change the item number to six, then it will reset it back to four for the next document number. Reorder reminders, you can change this preference from available quantity to on hand quantities when reorder points are set. You have the unit of measure. We go over this in further detail in our items section. You can have different unit of measures set up for single or multiple units of measure. If you buy in a specific unit of measure, such as you buy in a case for pop, but you sell single units, then you would want multiple units of measure. Again, we'll go over this in further detail in the item section. We're done with this, so we will click Save to save our changes. And that concludes our video on inventory preferences. In this video, we're going to demonstrate the pricing company preferences. Let's go to File, Preferences, Company Preferences, and we'll go down to the pricing. This section is for the default price. You use this section to change your default pricing. In a multi-store installation, you may want to use price levels to create different pricing for each location. Change the default pricing to the appropriate price level that corresponds to the store. In the price level section, you can change the name of the four additional price levels and the standard markdown percentage. By default, the standard markdown level for all price levels is set at 10%. Therefore, a best practice recommendation is to edit both the price level names and markdown percentages before setting up items. Keep in mind, if you want to mark a price level up from your regular price, you would then enter a negative markdown. And then the last section is a price tag code that will represent each of the numbers. Use a price tag code template to print price tags that will display the code you created for the cost in the last received date. This is useful if the sales clerk wants to know the cost of an item to be able to offer a discount if asked. Once you have your pricing set the way that you want, then you would save and close. And that concludes our video for the pricing company preferences. In this video, we're going to demonstrate on how to set up the purchasing company preferences. Go to File, Preferences, Company. We'll go down to Purchasing. First, you have the purchase order numbering. You can set or change the purchase order numbering scheme. You have your options here, and it will show you the example of what you had chosen based on these selections. You can also choose what starting number you want. You have an eight digit maximum, numbers only. Here is another option if you want to reset automatic order numbering sequencing when the order number is manually edited. In the next section we have the purchase order status. You can edit the name or add additional statuses for use with purchase orders. We go over much more detail in this in the purchase order section. And in the last section you have the printed purchase order message. You can enter text that you wish to be printed on every purchase order. One example could be deliveries at the rear door only. And this will not show up on your purchase order form. This is just automatically added. And that completes our section on purchasing and the company preferences. Once you have this completed the way that you want, click Save and that takes us out to the home screen. 
And this completes our demonstration on how to set up the purchasing company preferences. In this video, we're going to demonstrate how to set up your receiving company preferences. Go to File, Preferences, Company. We'll choose Receiving. If you choose this box to warn when receiving against PO passes cancel date, QuickBooks will warn you when receiving against a purchase order that has passed the cancel date specified on the order. If this preference is not selected, the cancel date is ignored when receiving. You can also choose the preference to enter vendor billing information in QuickBooks Point of Sale Desktop. Check this box to enter the invoice and due dates in QuickBooks Point of Sale Desktop. This is a best practice recommendation. Otherwise, all vouchers will be sent to QuickBooks Desktop Financial as item receipts requiring extra work to turn them into a bill. The last one is the printed voucher information. You can enter a message to be printed on each voucher. Once you set up everything the way that you want, click Save, and that will take you out to the home screen. I think my daughter, from what she's yelling, has seen a snake outside. <laughs> so I'm going to conclude this video. In this video, we're going to demonstrate how to set up the sales company preferences. Go to File, Preferences, Company. We'll go down to the sales. First we have our general options. On our receipts we can show how we want to display the full customer name. When you're printing a group item on a receipt or order you can decide whether you want to just print the group price only or if you want to just print the item prices only or if you want to print both the group and item prices. You can also choose to require a promotional code. This is if you want to require a promo code on all receipts. You can also choose to require a manual media account or an XZ out. This requires entries in the media account window on the Z out cash draw report. You can also choose the preference to allow selling miscellaneous items from receipts. The best practice is to turn this off unless implementing QuickBooks Point of Sale Desktop for an existing business and even then for a limited time. The next one is to allow the return of more items than sold on a receipt. And then the next section is regarding the open cash drawer. This controls what tenders will open the cash drawer Usually it's the check and the cash. The next section is the discount section. The best practice is to require a reason for manual discounts. You can also choose to print coupons on receipts. If a coupon is set up in the price manager, an option can be set to print the coupon on the receipt. And you can also decide if you want to include the coupon on every receipt, every so many receipts number that you choose, or when the receipt total exceeds a certain dollar amount. You can also choose to exclude receipts with rewards customers assigned. The next one is the receipt message. In the receipt message, you can enter text written on all the receipts given to customers. You may want to put a thank you on here. You may want to put your return instructions on here or news about an upcoming event. With the shipping section, you can enable the shipping manager to use the ship manager engine for UPS shipping only. This also allows for adding or removing various other shipping types. For example, store, truck, etc. And the last one is receipt tendering. You can turn on or off the various type of tenders to be accepted. 
as well as the credit cards to be accepted. You have the tips feature. This can be turned on or off. And you also have the ability to block on account sales when outstanding charges are past due beyond a specific time. This can be controlled in the past due payment section. Once you have set up your information for sales the way that you want, you can click save, it takes us out to the home screen, and that concludes our demonstration on the sales company preferences. In this video, we're going to demonstrate how to set up customer company preferences. Go to file, go to preferences, choose company, go down to the customers tab. The first section is to use with QuickBooks. This will cause all the customer information to be synced with QuickBooks desktop financial software. Consider the effect on list limits in QuickBooks Desktop Financial when enabling this feature. The Customer Tracking Options will require the clerk to enter a name on the sale receipt. Consider creating a customer called Cash Customer if this feature is enabled. If the customer is using Constant Contact, enter the login information to use the email marketing feature inside the customer center. With the customer type, create customer types that can be selected in a customer record providing additional filtering capabilities. Once you have set your preferences up, click save and this takes you out to the home screen and that concludes our video on how to set up customer preferences. In this video, we will demonstrate how to set up the sales orders, work orders, and layaway preferences. Go to File, Preferences, Company. All of the preferences work the same for each of these order types. Therefore, we will just cover just the sales orders. The initial deposit is used to either suggest or require an initial deposit using a percentage of the total amount. If require is chosen, then the sales order will not be allowed to be processed until the required deposit is tendered. With the sales order status, you can use existing statuses to manage the workflow of the sales order. Consider adding statuses such as waiting for pickup, to indicate that the sales order is complete and waiting for the customer's pickup. You can also put waiting for parts in the example of a work order. In this way, you can filter for specific statuses to determine next steps. You also can have a printed sales order message. You might use this message to convey your order cancellation, policy, return policy, or a simple thank you whatever is important for your business and your customers. And the next section is the document numbering section. This is found under the sales order section and relates to the ability to change the numbering scheme for each of the various documents. You can choose how you want the numbering to show if you want the date and the sequential number and it will show you an example. And then you can also have a starting number, eight digits maximum, and it can be numbers only. Once this is complete, you can click Save. And keep in mind, you can do this with layaways and work orders. It's all the same. And this concludes our video on how to set up sales order, work orders, and layaways preferences. Workstation preferences define workstation specific settings and options, including hardware setup and printing configuration. To set workstation preferences, go to File, Preferences, Workstation. Under the General Preference, you can choose to automatically log out. The default is 15 minutes and it is recommended to enable this option if you do not set the logout after each sale preference to ensure the software will log out at some point. 
Here you have the appearance where you can reset the program to the original appearance on the workstation, including column order and size. You have your cash drawer where it will show if your receipt printer is attached and if your cash drawer connection is working. You have your barcode scanner, it just says if your barcode scanner is attached. You have your card reader. Again, it shows nothing because we don't have anything attached to this computer. You also have your hardware setup wizard and your test. you can test the card reader. My customer pull display. We don't have any setup. We have different options though. And you can have message displayed between the sales. You have a line one and line two. And then you can also choose a message displayed during sales. Again, you can use a hardware setup wizard to set this up. You have the touchscreen monitor. You can choose this preference if you want to enable your touchscreen features. That is, if you do have a touchscreen monitor. The physical inventory scanner. There are a couple of scanners that the QuickBooks Point of Sale works with. You can set that up. We also have your pin pads. So there are different pin pads that you can use. You have the hardware setup wizard for that. And you have available printers. So these are all of my printers that are available to use. If you need to add a receipt or tag printer, then you start with the hardware setup wizard. Under documents and printers, there are print options. Under the general section, you can prompt for gift receipt with each sale. You can also prompt to email receipt with each sale. You want to make sure this pause between pages to allow tear off when printing is turned off. You don't need that on. You can choose to print multiple copies for credit card receipts and receipts tendered by account. Also for a print dialog you can display the print options dialog. I usually uncheck the sales receipts because what that does is when they're when your employee is ringing up a sale it will give them another box where they have to choose what print options they want so I usually uncheck that. Once you complete your workstation preferences click Save and that completes our demonstration on workstation preferences. The benefits of importing your QuickBooks items is that it saves time. There is no need for you to manually re-enter your QuickBooks financial software item information in point of sale. Your imported items are immediately available for use in the point of sale. Another benefit is efficiency. You can consolidate your items in the point of sale program, results in a more efficient purchasing and inventory control and a more meaningful reporting. And the last benefit is that there are fewer data entry errors. Less manual data entry means a lower likelihood of data entry errors. Then you may ask, why might I not want to import QuickBooks items? A few of the reasons are the item information in your software might not be current. If you have a large number of outdated inventory items in QuickBooks, you might not want this data transferred to your point of sale. If this is the case, you may want to take some time to clean up your QuickBooks item list by updating older records and deleting or inactivating unused ones. You can always import these items later. And the other reason you may not want to import your QuickBooks items is that the items are not defined to take advantage of the advanced inventory features of point of sale, such as the grouping of your items into styles if you just have the pro since QuickBooks financial software does not have similar features, it may be easier to start fresh by manually entering your items in point of sale in order to take full advantage of these features.
And those are some of the pros and cons of whether or not to import your QuickBooks items. All of your QuickBooks inventory items will be imported unless you choose to import only selected items. You will not be able to order, receive, or sell non-imported items in point of sale unless you enter them manually. Most users will want to import all their existing items. However, there may be good reasons to import only selected items. You may have items in QuickBooks that you do not resell. For example, shopping bags or cleaning supplies. You may want these items defined in QuickBooks financial software to accurately keep track of supply costs, but since it does not affect point of sale activities, there is no reason for the item to be in point of sale. You could choose not to import the item and instead track it in QuickBooks financial software. You may have a large number of outdated items that you no longer use in QuickBooks financial software. Rather than delete such items or make them inactive in the financial software, you may prefer not to import them. This way you still have an active record of these items in your financial software in case you need them in the future. Keep in mind, if you choose to divide your inventory, meaning you track certain items in your financial software and others in point of sale, you will only be able to conduct activities regarding a particular item in the program that tracks it. For instance, you cannot track item quantities in QuickBooks financial software but order it on a purchase order in point of sale. Hopefully this helps you decide on if you would want to just import certain selected items into your point of sale. You may have existing items in QuickBooks that you want to track in point of sale. You can easily import these items to point of sale at any time making them available to list on point-of-sale documents. Importing your QuickBooks items is optional. After importing, inventory items are not routinely exchanged between the two programs. The imported items should be tracked only in the point-of-sale after import. After the two programs are integrated, you will be prompted to import your QuickBooks items each time you open your item list in point of sale until you elect to import or indicate that you do not want to import. Choose Ask Me Again Later if you plan to import but are not ready to do at this time. To manually initiate an import of your QuickBooks items, go to your QuickBooks financial software make sure that your software is running in single user mode and it says here switch to multi-user mode so that does mean that we're in single user mode then go back to your QuickBooks point of sale software Go to your financial menu. Go to the advanced options page. And then choose import items now. Next you can choose the items descriptive fields. So here is the item name. This is what's printed on the receipts. So you can choose from your QuickBooks financial software what you want to show within the item name. The item description, you can record additional information as a sale is made. So if you don't want anything in this field, you can choose none. Or if you want to enter the sales description again, you can do that, that's fine. The alternate lookup, this information can be used to quickly look up an inventory item. 
this field is automatically populated with information from the name number field in QuickBooks Financial software and can't be changed. Click Next. By default, all inventory items are imported from your financial software. However, if you want to, you can choose only specific items for import. If you only want to choose certain items for import, click Yes, and then choose Import Now, and you can choose which items you want to import. You can select all, you can unselect all, you can filter. Once you choose what you want to import, you can choose OK. I'm going to cancel this right now because I don't want to mess up my QuickBooks point of sale. The importing of items from QuickBooks can be done multiple times. This can be helpful if you import only selected items the first time and later want to import the others or you want to import from multiple QuickBooks company files and you possibly could have added new items to QuickBooks after the initial import. Be careful not to import the same items a second time or duplicate item records will be created in point of sale. Once imported, the imported item should no longer be tracked in QuickBooks. It is strongly recommended that all purchasing, receiving, and selling of these items be done in the point of sale only. The on-hand quantity of imported items is set to zero in QuickBooks and a compensating general journal transaction is created to debit the inventory asset account. On the point of sale side, inventory adjustment memos are created to record the addition of the items to inventory. The memos are sent to QuickBooks balancing against the general journal transaction so that no net change in inventory value occurs. Imported items should be reviewed and edited to take advantage of the inventory tracking and control features in point of sale. If you have existing items and customers and vendors in an application other than QuickBooks financial software, you may be able to import this data using the Data Import Wizard. And that concludes our video on how to import QuickBooks items. The Data Import Wizard is designed to relieve you of the time-consuming task of manually entering or updating large amounts of existing data into QuickBooks Point of Sale Desktop. The wizard takes customer, vendor, or item information entered into a Microsoft Excel spreadsheet or a comma delimited text file and transfers this information into the corresponding data fields in QuickBooks Point of Sale Desktop. The wizard can be used to import data from various sources, such as a predefined Excel import template, the wizard can be used to import data from various sources, such as a predefined Excel import template in QuickBooks Point of Sale Desktop, or an existing Excel spreadsheet or comma delimited file. And the last one is data provided by vendors, such as catalog information for new inventory items or updates to existing items. To use the import wizard, go back to our QuickBooks point of sale. We'll select files, utilities, import. This informational screen will tell you how to add new data and update existing data. We'll click next. Choose the type of data to import. In this case, we're going to choose inventory items. You could also choose item pictures, vendors, or customers. Choose Next. The Data Import Wizard will ask you if you want to use a default template, such as this one. And here you have your vendors 
and your customers with this default template or you can use a custom file such as this one that we created and again you can use the vendor catalog we want to use a custom file choose next here it will ask us which file that we want to import we'll click browse there you go next we have to select a worksheet we'll choose sheet one and then we need to enter on what row the data starts on and our data starts on line two next we have to manage our mappings select add new from the mapping box drop down click the field to be mapped and select the drop down arrow select the field that corresponds with the field in the QuickBooks point of sale desktop click show all available fields and it will bring up all of the fields from the QuickBooks point of sale Note that the item name field says it's the only required field. If item number, item type, and tax code are not mapped, point of sale will assign an item number, the item type will be inventory, and the tax code will be tax. This concludes part one of using the import data wizard. Now that your template is displayed in Excel, let's go through the columns. I have already entered the items for the inventory transfer. Move along the column header cells to view how many characters the field will transfer over to your point of sale file. Now let's look at the item number field. The item number is a unique number that identifies each item. The point of sale system will automatically create a number upon import. I would leave this field blank. If you need to add item numbers from a previous system, I would suggest using the alternate lookup field. The item name is a short description of the item. It prints on your receipt. The item name is a required field for transfer over to the point of sale company file. You can add your department name to the items. If you leave any rows blank, it will create a generic name like system. You would have to go into the QuickBooks point of sale file and change it later if you left this field blank. The department code is a three letter code to be associated with departments. The item description can be the same as the item name or another description for products. What I usually do is I take the item name column and I copy the whole column and then I paste it over into the item description. Some people like to have longer descriptions so if that's the case go ahead and create your own description. The brief description is another description field for the product. If you're converting from another system and your barcode numbers do not contain 12 or 13 digits, you will want to enter them into this alternate lookup field. Otherwise, your barcode scan will not work with the UPC field. You may have a field with an alternate lookup number and a UPC number. Also, if you're creating custom barcodes, I would suggest to use your item number in this field. That way it will be easy to look up your items and not duplicate a code. And I know that you're thinking that we're not putting any item numbers on this sheet, so you probably want to wait till we import it and then QuickBooks will assign it an item number. Next you enter the attribute such as color pattern or a second size if needed. You can also enter any sizes that you want to show to correlate with the item. Average unit cost, which is calculated average cost per unit of an item, can be added in this field. We strongly suggest to only use this field upon setup of your QuickBooks point of sale file. This field can be left blank if you want to enter it in later on. Order cost is simply the cost per item charged from your vendor. In the next two columns, you can enter your vendor name and your vendor code. The vendor name can be the preferred vendor that you want to use, and the vendor code is a three-digit code 
just like your department code that gives you an added way to search for a vendor. Okay, let's continue working with the data import template. We will start off with the regular price. The regular price is the price that you charge your customers and it doesn't include any discounts or anything like that that you would offer. The manufactured suggested retail price would be the retail price that your manufacturer suggests. This field can also be left blank and the regular price field can also. You have four custom price levels. These are used to offer different prices to different customer groups. No entry is required for transfer. Tax code is a required field. Enter your tax code. It can be tax or non depending on how it's set up in your preference types. Enter the 12 or 13 digit UPC number. If the UPC numbers only contain 12 digits, you will have to enter a zero on the front of the number. You can transfer numbers that are shorter or longer than 12 or 13 digits, but the scanner will not recognize them. The item type is a required field. You can choose from inventory part, non-inventory part, and service. Group or assembly items will not transfer. They don't tell you that it's required for transfer, but I found out the hard way that it is. So you want to make sure that you have something in your item type field. You'll see the quantity for store, so you'll see the quantity going from 1 to 20, and that's because point of sale allows you to have 20 different remote stores. So what you can do here is if you are using one store, you can just go ahead and enter in your, your on-hand quantity for the first store. If you have multiple stores, when you set that up in your preferences, you will label each store uh, store 2, store 3, store 4, and you can enter in the quantities on hand if you want to. This is not a required field. You can do this later if you want to, but a lot of people like to enter it in right now so that they start out with knowing what their quantity is. Custom fields can be used to enter any other information you need to track. You have five custom fields that you can use as needed. For instance, I had one company who had used item styles as a custom field and that was how they identified their items from their previous point of sale. And so we entered that into the custom field and it worked out really well for them. You can choose your company reorder point for your headquarter and remote stores. If you're using multi-store, or you can use a company reorder point for your store if you, for just one store. So for the company reorder point here, I'm just showing what it is, what the totals are for everything combined. Units of measure. If you use this feature, I would suggest you set it up after the transfer. The system will walk you through how to set it up correctly. If you want to enter it on the spreadsheet, you enter the smallest measure that applies to the item in the base units of measure. Then you enter the units that you order the item in, and then you enter the units that you sell the item in. Please watch our next video that completes our point of sale import template. We'll start off with the print tags in this. Here you can put the yes, no, or just leave it blank, and then it will default to yes. An orderable field can be yes or no or blank. If it is blank, it will default to no. The serial number tracking, you can enter yes, no, or leave it blank. If you leave it blank, it will default to no. The eligible for commission field, this includes sales of this item when calculating commission. Next, you have your QuickBooks cost of goods sold account. This is used for integrating with your QuickBooks financial software. So you have your cost of goods sold, your sales, and your inventory asset account. The next one is a manufacturer account. That's if you have a manufacturer for your product that you want to put in that field. And this is the eligible for rewards accounts. So if you have a rewards program, you can enter yes, no, or leave it blank. And if you leave it blank, that means no, that they're not eligible for rewards. The last one here in this section is the weight, and that's if you ship your items, you can enter the weight. And the last fields that we have are the vendor fields. These are the vendors that you purchase from that are 
set from your primary vendor. So with these fields, you can have a second vendor name, they can have a UPC number, they can have an alternate lookup number, and an order cost. You have your third vendor name, your fourth one, and then your fifth one. And the last one is a sync to mobile. If you click yes on this, it will create a check mark in the sync to mobile and you can sell those items that you select yes to on your mobile device. As long as you have a subscription to Intuit credit cards. And that completes our demonstration on how to fill out the Excel spreadsheet for the data import wizard. The data import log provides a way to review the results of an import operation and identify errors in items that were not imported. From the file menu, select utilities, then view data import log, select a date and optionally a time from the available logs column on the left. You have the following additional options in the log. You can select the Show Errors Only checkbox at the top of the window to make it easier to identify where errors occurred. You can click a hyperlink in the entry, if available, to take you to the corresponding program area where you can review the record in question. Click Print to print the log. When finished, click Close. And that's how you use the data import log.